Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's so nice to see you all. Um, my name is Hope. I am the life design educator at the Life Design Lab here at Hopkins. It's our new version of the Career Center. Um, we're really focused on supporting students in you know, identifying their interests and trying to apply those not only to a career, but a life that they generally will love. Um, and so I'm joined tonight by Nicolene. Nicolene, I'll let you introduce yourself. Great, thanks. I didn't have my finger poised. Uh, yeah, I'm Nicolene Wilson. I am director of Homewood Arts Programs. I have been at Johns Hopkins now for, um, I'm in over nine years. Um, I started with Hopkins Symphony, uh, managing that um, organization, ensemble. Um, and um, my background is in performance, clarinet and orchestral, um, but my doctorate um, then was in arts management and nonprofit management. Um, and so then for the last now two years, first as interim and now permanently, I'm director of Homewood Arts Programs, which oversees all of the co-curricular arts programming on campus. So including the 50 student arts organizations, Center for Visual Arts, Hopkins Symphony, um, and just the, the various and ever expanding ways that, that we have arts programming on campus um, for Homewood students and beyond. Um, so yeah. It's great to be here and, and see you all. Thank you so much. So Nicolene and I partnered on this program because it came from students in the spring of last year before COVID hit and before we all <laughs> separate, went our separate ways. Um, uh, hearing from people who are doing perhaps maybe some non-traditional type of jobs. I think a lot of students felt like, well, with the arts, you can really only you know do a small subset of things. And so we wanted to bring back people who we felt were applying their arts interests in really unique and interesting ways. So tonight's panel, we've got three incredible people here to share their stories with us. I'm going to you know, let them introduce themselves and then I'll potentially pose the first question. And then I think, let's just open it up because we've got people ready to chat. So why don't we go ahead and go in alphabetical order. Let's start with Elizabeth. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope your semester is going well. <laughs> I can't imagine because work has been interesting. I actually am a classically trained musician. I, I play the oboe and I started piano when I was like five or six, like most people do. Um, most musicians, I guess, do. And I attended Hopkins. I went to the Kruger School and I have a bachelor's degree in Romance Languages and I have a bachelor's from Peabody as well in oboe performance. While I was, um, well, what I do today now is I am the manager of institutional partnerships at the Baltimore Symphony and as a classical musician, that's like super cool. Um, and <laughs> and uh, I think that's all I'm supposed to introduce real quick just for the, all right, cool. Then I will kick it to whoever is next, which I think is Leela, if we're going alphabetically. Okay. Hi, everyone. And thanks for having me on the show. Um, I, <laughs> I have two degrees from um, Peabody. I have my bachelor's of music and my master's of music, both in flute performance from Peabody. Um, and that was I'm probably one of the older ones of uh, uh, one of your guests. <laughs> so it was a little while ago. Um, after that, I went to uh, Germany and I got an artist diploma in Berlin. And then I had my life and I worked as a performing musician and then I decided to do an MBA. So I just finished my MBA at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. And now I am, um, it's interesting that you're having me on the show right now because I, I'm looking for new ways to in integrate both sides of myself, you know, the musical side and the business side. Um, right now I am president and CEO of Indie Baroque Music Inc, which is a small, nonprofit organization um, that is a Baroque orchestra that I actually performed in um, up until just last year. <laughs> and I and so I was performing and leading at the same time and being board president, which so I wore, as with many um, or small organizations, I wore many different hats and I do all kinds of um, things for the organization. But I'm glad to be here and happy to answer any questions you have. And I will turn it over to Phillips. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Phillips Mitchell. Uh, I have a bachelor's in English from Johns Hopkins. I was class of 2013. Um, in terms of my arts background, I'm definitely the least musical and probably artistic on, on this panel, but 
I did grow up, you know, taking piano lessons for like my entire childhood. I think I picked up cello again in like sixth grade. Um, but when I came to, to Hopkins, I just dropped basically all my instrument playing. Um, however, I was involved in witness theater, which I believe is still on campus. It was like the only, or one of the few student run theater groups at the time. So I was a playwright um, for witness theater um, during my time there. Um, to like, to be frank, I, I haven't played instruments in a while, but I'm an avid consumer of the arts and avid participant in the arts. Um, I live in New York now and I, um, I work with Google. I've been there for five years. I started out on the West Coast um, and I moved back to the East Coast, specifically to New York City, because I wanted to be in much closer proximity to the arts. Um, in my current job, I'm a TV and advanced media product specialist. All that means is that I connect uh, publishers, advertisers, sometimes movie studios, um, all to each other and make sure they're taking advantage of Google's technology uh, to promote whatever they're trying to sell. Perfect. Phillips, we are having the same crackly issue again, just FYI. Crackly? I wonder if it's my headphones. I think it is. I think it might be the it's all good. Can you hear me better now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Look at look at it. It's we got it. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Okay, so do you need me to repeat myself? Or okay, I think we caught it. Did anyone have anything they wanted to clarify? Okay, we got it. We're doing great. Don't worry. Okay, so. I do want to give time and space, you know, to our guests to ask questions. Um, and so I actually think I'm just going to hold and I'm going to pause. So David, I am going to kick it to you. I want you to start us off. What, what do you want to pose to the panel tonight? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, cool. All right. So hi everybody. Thank you for being here and sharing your expertise. Um, yeah, I had a, a question for each of you. Who wants to go first? Okay. Um, okay. Well, Phillips, yes. Awesome. I, we just heard from you. So, um, when I was reading in sort of the the, the preparatory materials for this, um, I, I I came up with the the. I'm curious about where is the overlap between like Google, uh, technology, art, and equity. I think I think equity was a word that was in your in your uh, text. And so I'm wondering, so like, cool. So yeah, I was just wondering, like, where's the intersection there? Like, I think I understand the, the sort of the business relationships between advertising publishers and movie studios, but how do you, um, how, how do those intersect with other arts uh, and with sort of equity in general? Like, so yeah. That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, some people always say, oh, the internet is the great equalizer, but not really. Uh, if you're not pulling the right levers um, as like a, as an internet company like, like Google. Um, so uh, for the past year, I've been a co-lead of the Black Googler Network, which is like a thousand, thousands of people organization um, who like work at Google um, and are helping to help, you know, promote racial equity, et cetera, within Google. Um, and currently, like, I'm on a working group now that, like, directly interfaces with the CEO of Google and gets to influence, like, product and policy uh, across the company for more equitable outcomes. Um, where the art specifically uh, ties into this, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as close with this as I used to be. Like, my role has changed in the past year. Um, we have Google Arts and Culture which is just a nonprofit within the company that like promotes, uh, well, the first project was we want to digitize all the world's art um, in the same way that our mission statement is to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful. Um, art, the arts are also part of it. So if you go to like the Google Arts and Culture app, for example, that we launched like two years ago, you can find just like a catalog of sculpture, painting, uh, recordings of music, et cetera. So I think that project is, it's extremely ambitious, um, but so was Google Books and projects that we've had a, a lot of success with before. Um, I know that during uh, COVID in particular, 
um, Google dove like headfirst into that project for performing arts because a lot of people who are who are not able to see performances anymore because of social distancing guidelines, et cetera. Um, we've been, you know, producing um, for YouTube uh, and recording a lot of performances and like streaming them for free um, on the YouTube platform. And the Google Arts and Culture team uh, in particular has been giving like museum tours of like sort of everything from like the Louvre to like smaller museums that you might not hear about if you're not like an art history major or something like that. Um, so I think that's where like the equity and art and tech piece uh, all align at Google. That's, that's, that's awesome. And then I just, I got interrupted by my uh, Google Wi-Fi point over here. It heard you say Google and it's like, oh, oh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're glad. <laughs> <laughs> More intersections. But that's, that's wonderful. And I'm, I'm, I was aware of the arts and culture app, but I haven't really like dived into it. Um, I'll have to dig deeper. It sounds like you guys are doing uh, really cool work over there. How do you guys uh, take care of the performers and the, the creators as you make this content available? Um, I haven't done any like theater projects with that team, so I, I can't speak to that. But I do know for like um, the New York City Ballet, I can just speak to that because I, I live pretty close to Lincoln Center. Um, they've been doing like fundraisers on YouTube and streaming previously unshown recordings of ballets. Um, like we've added this new donation bar like underneath YouTube videos. So say if an institution wanted to show content for a limited period of time um, and like have in, and have a basically a fundraiser virtually, we've added that that new feature. Um, that's one example that that I can give. Awesome. David, did you want to keep rolling with your questions? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm monopolizing. Uh, I think they're helpful for everybody. That was so okay. interesting. Cool. Well, then I will, I will onward, onward. Who's next? Are we going to go in reverse alphabetical order now? All right. <laughs> Leela, uh, thank you again for, for being here. Um, uh, so I'm curious, uh, Indie Baroque, how, how long has that uh, organization been, been running? Yeah, so Indie Baroque is um, 32 years old. Awesome. And they started as a very small chamber orchestra, I mean, cham chamber ensemble, basically, a group of friends um, who got together and played, and, and then it kind of grew and mushroomed from there. And at the point where we got... Um, a, really a pioneer of the early music movement to be the artistic director. Bartels Kuyken is the foremost Baroque flutist in the world. He is our artistic director. Then things began artistically to really increase, but not on the management side because there was a real disconnect. And so I think um, what I've been able to do through my my studies and my knowledge of, of nonprofits is is to kind of bring the management up in par um with with the artistic level so that's it's been really an exciting opportunity awesome how are you growing the audience for baroque music like are you are you finding traction with like younger people are you like through social media like what works for you guys and, and what have you tried that doesn't work yeah so that's a really good question um yes we are using social media um we, i actually opened a uh TikTok account <laughs> which I never thought I'd say in my whole world, in my whole life, but we have this fantastic, uh, so we got, we got a building a marketing, marketing capacity grant from Lily Endowment uh, just this spring. And we were, that enabled us to kind of really increase our marketing footprint. And what we did is we, um, first of all, hired someone to do a, a, a strategic marketing plan for us. Um, and he, subsequently became a board member because he believed in what we were doing so much. But we hired a Kelly MBA student, like a current student, to be our digital media intern for um, the summer and then for this, the fall again. 
And that is largely um, thanks to the pandemic because the, there are a whole bunch of MBA students who had their internships revoked or um, you know, just they, they lost those opportunities and they need to do those. So she, she's a Chinese student who is really um, adept with digital media and she worked for Starbucks in um, China. And she actually got um, got them to approve one of her initiatives, um, and it was just really cool what she what she did. So what is she, what is she doing? She is reaching out to a younger audience through Instagram. Through um, I don't think she's using Snapchat, but she's using Twitter and Facebook. And now we have this. Well, we tried WeChat, but we couldn't get it to work. It was when all that was going on. <laughs> um, so now we have this this TikTok account, and I'm not sure what she's going to do with that. The whole idea is not to just focus on the young people, but to keep bringing our traditional audience into this kind of digital world that they may or may not be comfortable with. So we send out emails that have step by step. How do you actually get a Spotify account, you know, and follow us on Spotify? How do you, how would you actually watch a YouTube premiere? Um, because most of them don't know how to do that. Now, a lot of them know how to click on a, a Zoom link if they want to go to church, you know, and they haven't been able to do that. But I, I feel like there's some education that needs to be involved in that. And th so we're focusing on both ends at the same time, um, building that young audience with content that may be um, exciting to them. Because Baroque music is is really the flip side of modern music. And then you've got the whole canon in between romantic music. <laughs> um, but Baroque music can be seen as kind of hip and alternative. Um, it acts, it, it kind of accesses the same kind of feelings of um, nimbleness and, and small, small um, alternative kind of niche music. So that's what we're, we're aiming towards with the younger crowd. And they seem to be responding to it, at least in the um, digital world, they respond to it. And we're trying to see if we can convert that to actual in-person attendance. That right. must have been a long answer for you. But <laughs> no, that was perfect. Because uh, you're, 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 you, you answered the question that I asked and the question that I didn't ask uh, that I should have asked. Uh, okay. is, is how, how are you engaging younger audiences, but also how are you engaging your current audience, especially today? Right. Uh, so that was, that's great. That all makes great sense. Um, do, do I get one more? So I would go ahead. I would, I know you got to go. So I think you should. So why don't you pose a question to Elizabeth? And then I see Natalia, you have a question in the chat. So we'll pivot to that. I think that pivots toward, you know, a question I have too. So I think we're moving in the right direction. You're all being very generous with me. Thank you. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, hi. Hi. Um, so, yeah, okay, the, the symphony. Uh, so, and, and you're, you're partnering with, with uh, the community organizations. What are, what are some of the most meaningful partnerships that you guys have uh, engaged in? And how did technology play into that? And how did they grow audiences and create like meaning and value for those audiences? So full disclosure, I've been there for two months, so I'm going to do my best to answer that question. <laughs> and I have a couple that I know about that I, that are very meaningful to me as a, pa a longtime patron and subscriber to the symphony. So the first of which is Orc Kids and um, our partnership with education, the Sid Baltimore City Public School System to really provide meaningful opportunities for people who otherwise wouldn't get it all right um and through not just through the musical instruction engagement of those kids but through uh giving them the social networks and the 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 other fundamental like basic maslow hierarchy needs having them be met through this program um and then watching those kids move through their academic career and and then move on into the world and survive and thrive and 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 build on right that that's that's probably the top partnership i could come up with in this this time one of the things that we're doing um well actually before i switch out of that uh we have pivoted or kids to the the virtual realm we're continuing all of our instruction and, all of, and the ma large majority of our services through that program this year in the digital realm and so we're doing uh zoom sessions zoom classes zoom lessons 
Um, and we have an understanding with the city schools that once they do start selectively opening certain areas, we will shift back into in-person because there are certain things that you simply need to do in person. We all know that. Um, other things that uh, that we have partnered on in, and in terms of technology, I'm trying to think about technological partnerships. Um, we did, so in May we uh, partnered with MPT to broadcast our BBC Proms 2018 concert. Um, and that was interesting because it went to a larger part of the state than we otherwise would have been able to reach because of the, 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 the network reach of, of MPT. Um, and we also heard that like people tuned into it and it outranked sort of the the local news and syndicated broadcasts that were happening at the same time. So like people were turn, tuning in intentionally to MPT and engaging with that program in a way that we we had no idea was going to happen. Like we were surprised that that happened. We were glad that it happened, but we were also surprised about it. Um, and then, you know, it's, we just, are starting to partner. I oh, mean, it really sucks that COVID came because technology doesn't play into the music partnerships. It really doesn't. Um, and because we were we 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 launched a program last year called Symphony in the City, and we're going to morph it into Symphony in the County for our Strathmore uh, marketing area. Um, and it really was a truly community focused and based partnership. You know, one of the sites uh, last year was going to be Morgan State with Morgan State Choir with um, the, I, 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 is it New Psalmist Baptist Church? I think that was also going to be incorporated into that performance. Um, and then, and then there are other sites that we were looking to do like Patterson Park and, and uh, way out, you know, west in, in Owings Mills, Randallstown. So really stretching out that corridor as well. So not just focusing on our city, um, but the larger area that we serve. And, and technology is, I will say that technology is gonna enable us to reach a lot more people than our in-person stuff did previously, but I think that we're gonna be able to translate that digital engagement into in-person, as Lila was talking about, <laughs> you know, going forward. And, um, and I think it is partially that you have to hook people, but you also have to bring around along your traditional audience. I totally echo everything that she just did. <laughs> she just said. Um, and and I'm excited because we're also at a pivotal point in our in our century plus history that we are really intentionally making a digital push, a digital transition, because we recognize that you're not, oh, nobody's going to survive unless they have a digital footprint anyway. I mean, that's pure business sense. Um, but again, it has long-term positive, 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 like the world of opportunity is, is just so much more larger when you really fully take into account all of the stuff, all of the sheer stuff and partnership opportunity that exists in the world. And, and, and it's making the connections that are important. Um, so being intentional about what connections you want to make and then how you want to translate that into program is equally as important as doing the work. Um, and I would just say community, our favorite partnerships are always going to be back in our local communities. So that's, that's the other part of it. So. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Awesome. I love Natalia's question because it really, it starts in the same direction where I was starting to go, just kind of hearing, you know, your initial thoughts around what each of you do. I, you know, I'm interested and Natalia is interested too. So the questions that Natalia put in the chat, um, you know, are specifically for Phillips, but I think we can broaden them a little bit and start with Phillips. Um, so my question really is like, can you walk us through your process? for like how you were determining what it was you wanted to do as a job and how did, you know, your interest and love of various arts factor into that? And then specifically Natalia's question is like, can you talk about, you know, any recommendations you have for walking your path towards your specific role um, and what that transition was like from undergrad or your specific program to a career? So it's a lot of questions, but Phillips, we'll start with you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
my career path was very non-linear. Um, <laughs> so I, I think my number one takeaway for y'all would be to like just be patient, but don't lose sight of your actual passions. So immediately following college, as I mentioned, I was a playwright at Hopkins. Um, and I wanted to go into theater. So I applied to a bunch of theater fellowships and internships and like literally didn't get any of them. Um, and I had no choice but to get a desk job, some boring corporate job outside of that world. Um, and I ended up working for this startup um, that was like an education, it was an educational platform. Almost when it, like, it's, it's interesting how now everyone is using these like online classrooms, but like back then it was so frowned upon. Um, a lot of the elite institutions, including Hopkins, that we were uh, pitching this product to were like, oh no, we're not an online university. Like we're never gonna need this type of hybrid platform. And now look at everyone um, on Zoom every day for class. Uh, so that was the first company that I worked for, just doing sales, and I was literally pitching this to universities. So not connected to the arts really at all. Outside of work, I was always, you know, writing and doing that, but I needed some sort of financial stability. Uh, and I, I like to say, like, I became like a happy sellout because that was my first intro into tech. Um, and then I, after that, I worked for another startup um, that was an advertising tech company. And um, I was working with like, movie studios in like the golden era of apps where like every studio is trying to build an app so they could have people also pay for movies on their phones. Um, so once again, like kind of, this was like right place, right time. That company got acquired um, by a large advertising agency. And I had to make the decision of like, should I stay and work for this large, larger company that employed me or uh, that bought the company or, or try something new? And that's when I jumped to Google and started, they were building a copy of the team that I worked on at the startup and wanted me to build those relationships again with the big agencies in LA. So I moved across the country to California. Um, I got some really, got to meet some like cool people, like walk around on like the Fox lot. Like I had never even been to California before until I got these jobs in tech and like um, all of this like movie Hollywood stuff was like kind of a pipe dream to me. I was like, oh, I, I think I just like the, the stage. Um, but just getting that exposure then led me to what my like next move is outside of work, which is I really want to like, I've been in business now for so long. I really want to like finance and produce films. So uh, there's some Googlers who are directors that, you know, so they film commercials for Google, but outside of work, um, they're filming their own short films. So I just got asked by uh, like a budding director at Google if I could like produce his feature film. So I'm totally doing that on the side. And I think what's cool about Google is they totally encourage you to pursue your passions outside of work or during work, um, as long as you spend 80% of your time doing your core role. So I'm just very lucky uh, about these this chain of occurrences and I'm, I think, I've always kind of been fear, kind of fearless. Like I don't mind jumping into it, jumping to a new company or a new opportunity. I always learn something extremely valuable. Um, and I think I am now coming back to that, you know, script start that I had at Hopkins um, and like production. It's just doing it for film, which will be some, it's something that I'm excited to do uh, in my in my spare time. And I'm just lucky that Google encourages that type of behavior because like we're using all of our work tools and <laughs> um, some other some of the cast members might be Googlers uh, as well and we can we can I don't know finance and like organize a lot of it online we'll just have to figure out a way to shoot it which will be fun I think as well figuring out how to shoot during a pandemic that's so cool and so I love how it your experiences and your fearlessness, you just built, right? I feel like the more fearless you are, the more willing you're, you are to try something, the right things just kind of keep happening or you have, you know, options to be able to pivot one way or the other. So thank you for sharing that. Leela, how about you? How, you know, how did you kind of come, what's your journey? Like, how did you get to where you are and how much did the arts kind of support you or help you or push you to make certain decisions in your life 
Um, yeah. Sure. I I also had a nonlinear journey. I think most people do, and I and I really appreciated hearing about your your path, Phillips, and what you're coming into next. It sounds very exciting. Um, the opportunity to produce films and uh, still do your job and, and do it at the same time. It's really wonderful. So my journey took me over the continents because I, um, I fell in love with a German guy when I was at Peabody. <laughs> and I wanted to go see what his country was like before I decided where I wanted to live or whether I wanted to stay with him. So we went to Germany and in Germany, um, you apply for schools um, that during the summer and then you start in the fall. So it's, it's very, it's a sh very short kind of window. So I went over there and I did all my auditions in July and then I started in Berlin um, with the principal of the Berlin Philharmonic as my teacher in October. And the first thing I, I did there was I went on a tour with their flute ensemble to Hong Kong and South Korea. So it was like the, the world kind of went like that all of a sudden. <laughs> and um, long story short, we, we ended up getting married. And so we had to make a decision whether we were going to stay in Europe or whether we were going to come back to the US. And um, at that time in my life, uh, it was difficult to be in Germany as, um, as a biracial person in the arts. Um, I was taken as, and, and I don't know if this is what you want to talk about, but this is part of my journey. <laughs> I was I was taken as um, a Turkish person because they are the majority minority population in Germany. And so I, I kind of, um, every artistic experience I have had was fantastic. And every kind of daily on the street kind of interaction I had was bad. And so I had to kind of weigh those things. And I went into it thinking, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to change people's minds. And um, using all that kind of um, artistic creativity and connectivity that you learn when you're a musician um, and communication skills. However, they were not ready for it. <laughs> so, so I ended up coming back to um, Peabody and then I did my master's uh, at Peabody. And during that time, my husband got a job. Um, he went on the job market kind of, he was at Johns Hopkins he, in the Germanic studies department. And he went on the job market and got a position at Indiana University. So we moved here, me as a faculty wife, um, younger than most of his students. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was kind of an awkward position to be in. And then I did, I, I started subbing for the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra um, as a flutist there. And I, I had a connection with their principal flutist who also studied at Peabody. So it's nice to kind of use those connections. Um, and I did that for many, many years. I had my children and, and then I got into Baroque flute playing. I picked that back up from my, my days at Peabody. So it was kind of a developing of what do I don't want to do with my life? Do I want to keep performing? I mean, I, I got to perform at Carnegie Hall. I got to perform in the big stages in Germany and in the Washington National Cathedral and all that. And I kind of thought, is this all there is to life? And that it just wasn't enough for me. I, I kind of wanted to explore a different part of my brain and see what there was, um, what was possible. So I decided to enroll in the MBA program. And that was three years ago. And it was a two year program only for people who were working. So at that time I was the interim executive director of, of Indie Baroque. Um, and I learned, it was kind of like, a, it was kind of like a sandbox. I got to, all the things that I learned, I got to try out immediately in put the, putting them into practice and watching them really work. And so the, the, the organization grew by 60% in a year. <laughs> so it was just like putting all those little things into place and being sort of um, open about how we could implement them um, was really fulfilling. So then I reached a point where you're supposed to look for a job once you get your MBA, <laughs> like a, a, a different kind of job. Um, and that's kind of where I am right now. I'm, I, so I'm, I'm telling you my progression up until here. And so where I am right now is I feel like there's two paths I could take. I could take, like Phillips was saying, the office job, you know, the desk job where you're, you're, you, I'm using my MBA skills, but I might not be incorporating all that creativity. 
Um, or I could go the orchestra management route and go into executive roles in orchestra management. And so that, that's kind of where the, the choice, the, the, the fork in the road where I am right now, um, and I'm just being very transparent with you all, it's exciting. And, and you have to know what you value. You have to know what you're willing to give up, what you're willing to trade in, what, what is so dear to you that you need to keep it. And so my advice to all of you students would be to know your value, know you, what, what value you offer to society, because then you can pursue different kinds of opportunities that might not be what you think you can pursue. So like maybe your value isn't just playing the flute. You know, maybe you have hidden skills that you that you didn't think that you had, um, and that could lead to a, a kind of waving path that um, that that you could, well like like what I did. <laughs> so that's a long answer. <laughs> but it's it's so it illustrates exactly what we're getting at at like life design, which is like you've got different forks in the road, you've got different options you can choose. You're trying to decide what your values are, what you like and what you don't like. And that, you know, yes, for some jobs, there are very clearly you know, steps you have to take or things you have to do or accomplish, but that for most of them, as long as you tell your story in an effective way and share your transferable skills, you can make a pivot, you can make it work. So your story Definitely. illustrates that. And I have to say that I was really worried that my artistic community wouldn't, you know, would think I was selling out when I started my MBA, but no, everybody was, in, they totally were on board. They were like my cheerleaders, you know, go Lila. Yeah. <laughs> so it was really nice to have, have um, the community of my creative community, but also as I got to know the business community to have, have like a really multi cultural, multi um, industry kind of network. Yeah. Let's kick it to Elizabeth and then Sophia. I see your question in the chat. We're definitely going to get to that just next. Um, so Elizabeth, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about kind of your journey to where you are and how arts were and were not kind of a defining factor for you and how you've been able to weave it in. So I actually probably had the most linear <laughs> <laughs> track of the three of us. Um, I So at Peabody, I was a work study student and my job was in the Peabody archives. And while I was there, I actually was responsible for going through about a decade of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's files. And I was exposed to the, to the, to the role of arts administrators and arts management. And, and I was like, oh, big puzzle. I like this. <laughs> Um, and I also, you know, about knowing your, your own worth and the value you bring, I knew I didn't want to be a performer, you know? I mean, part of undergrad is that you shouldn't be coming in being so focused on one thing, right? You should be open to learning other things and to experimenting with different classes and different majors and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so for me, you know, I saw my Hopkins undergrad as both at Krieger and at Peabody as just a time to be exposed and to learn and to, to meet people and to, you know, I met my husband um, and that kind of stuff. So those life developments. Um, and so I left, I graduated in 2005 and I actually was a touring musician with my husband for, for two years. Um, and then I got off the road and I worked for Howard Community College as a sort of recital hall manager. I managed the logistics of the recital halls and I did contracts with our faculty. And, you know, I also registered, did part of the registration process for our continuing education music program. Um, so I kind of went right into arts management after the performance aspect of the very short-lived performance aspect of my career. Um, and then from there, a friend of mine from my Master of Arts program in Arts Administration at Goucher College worked at the Howard County Arts Council, which is a county-based funding agency that provides grants to nonprofits and to individual artists and offers its own artistic programming. There are usually county arts agencies in every county across the state, across the country, some states, they just have their state arts council, but that's just so you know, it's a funding mechanism for nonprofits and for individual artists in, in most places. And so they had a front of desk, front desk position that was also facility management and dealt with our resident artists. And I applied for the job. She suggested I apply for the job. I applied for it. And lo and behold, that was my first real like arts administration legit 
desk job kind of, but it incorporated art in a different way. As a musician, I was dealing mostly with visual artists and our art gallery and, <laughs> and like our summer camps for kids who are coming in and doing arts and crafts with, with the noodle, the pasta, the pasta mosaics and, and <laughs> you know, the clay statues. And, and, and that was great and fun. It was, and it exposed me to a different part of the arts that I myself was not, had not been active in, you know, since I was a child doing some of these activities. Um, so that brought perspective that I didn't have before. And then one of the resident arts organizations in our, in the Howard County Arts Council building was the Chesapeake Shakespeare Company, where I, they were going through a capital campaign and they posted a position for a part-time capital campaign assistant manager. And I was full-time at the Howard County Arts Council, but you know, there are moments in your life where you're like, oh, I should take the pay cut and do that because the amount of learning and the amount of opportunity that will come from it is totally worth that abbreviated period of pay. Um, and so I applied and I got the job and I had was there until the end of June. Um, and so I saw them through Gosh, it was a six, six and a quarter million dollar um, capital campaign and renovation and opening in a new market. We moved from Howard County into Baltimore City. Um, and so the, the sheer learning of that process, the hands on learning, in addition to applying like Leela, the, the parts of your arts administration, arts management into the actual real life functionality of your organization and then watching it grow and, and, and develop and, and build new relationships with your audience members that that you know, six months earlier might not have been possible. Um, and while there, you know, I, I was hired as a fundraiser and a, and a grant writer, and I stayed in that role for a long time. Um, and my, my, I was fortunate enough to have um, our managing director as a mentor for several years of my, my career there. And she knew that I wanted to eventually make the shift into executive leadership of a, a nonprofit arts organization somewhere across the board. Um, and so uh, after I had my first child, when I came back from maternity leave, I came in as a new role and I was a finance manager, which basically functioned as a, a chief financial officer for that nonprofit, for our for CSC. And like, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that I'm an excellent fundraiser. I think you've, there are just a particular set of skills that you have to have in order to fundraise. You have to be a great writer. You have to be a great communicator. You have to be good at building relationships. Anybody who has a story to share and can do so effectively can be a great fundraiser. Um, but finance for me has been way more interesting because it is very black and white and you can tell the story with the numbers as easily as you can with words. Um, and so making sure that both the, the financial picture and the, the verbal picture line up together has been very interesting to me. Um, and now I am at the Baltimore Symphony raising money again. So, you know, it kind of, you come back to your roots at some point. And, and uh, you know, the thing that I'm most excited about uh, for the Baltimore Symphony is that it, it's an evolving in, uh, institution. And so um, I'm, I'm eager to be, uh, you know, incorporated into other departments over the tenure of my career there. Like I don't, I hope not to stay in the fundraising personally. And that's mostly a, a, a factor of where I am in my life stage right now. I have two small children. And so that has been very important in terms of protecting my nighttime and my weekend time. Um, for them, like I want to be around for them. Unfortunately for the pandemic, we're locked, all locked in our houses together. So it's really lots of close time right now. Um, but in real world, when does it get back into normal? Being, knowing that that's a priority for me will help me also uh, navigate all of the, the real work that we have to do in our roles too. So um, I agree everything that Leela and Phillips have said already, like, take it to heart and, and navigate your own paths in your own way. And don't be afraid to be, to not get locked into something and, and to, to be open to learning about, you know, things that you might not have previously thought were interesting, like me in finance, you know, who, who knew, who knew that that would be something that I was like, ah, oh, I love it. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that. Just be willing to go for it. And you'll end up in finance, maybe. 
<laughs> That's so great. Okay, we've got a question from Sophia and we've got one from Megan. Y'all are doing great. Okay, so I'm not gonna require anyone you know, to respond, um, but Sophia is asking, can anyone share their thoughts on new and emerging careers in the arts and humanities? So maybe things you've seen, read about, you see your friends doing. Nicolleen, you might have some thoughts here too. What, what are some new and emerging careers that students might be interested in checking out? So that was, it was extremely hard for me to hear what you were asking, but were you asking that question in the chat? It's or? open. Yes, it's Sophia's question. Okay, okay, I see. Hello. Could Sorry. You talk about your thoughts. No, no, no problem. Um, well, I'm curious, like, what your generation, like, is this the Gen Z who we're speaking to? Okay, yeah, okay. Like, what, I, I, like, what are new and emerging careers in, in, in arts and humanities? Like, I feel like what I think is new is probably old. Like, could you elaborate? Or are you asking me, like, have I seen any new careers develop? Sophia, do you have any clarifying pieces there? If, okay, if you have seen any new careers develop. Um, not, I mean, how new is new? Um, I've seen for, uh, I've seen the same functions, just add a digital title on the front or a virtual word on, on the front of the title. Um, like there's partner or like digital or virtual partner managers. And I'm like, you're just a talent agent. So like <laughs> at YouTube, we have all these like, they're either YouTube stars or um, educators who like use YouTube and are, are stars like in that, in their own right. Um, and they'll have like, a man basically a talent manager who helps them like gain subscribers and like add revenue on their on their platform um seems quite similar to what an old talent manager would do like trying to help an artist get a book deal um or you know get a, a role on a tv show or something like that um i think uh the, in terms of like a totally new space uh virtual reality which has been around for a couple of years, but product wise had, hasn't, you know, made it into every household. Um, it's definitely something that at least Google's thinking about. And I know like Facebook has their Oculus headset and there's like all, ty all types of, of those um, devices that have launched um, and are making their ways into more and more um, homes. So I'm sure there's going to be more like creative directors needed for VR than there are today. Um, I know there's some people who've had to pivot, like, oh, I used to film like a normal eight millimeter lens, and now I need to learn how to shoot with uh, a VR camera, some of which are 360, and they have like, I, like I've seen a virtual reality camera, and I was like, this is so crazy. It, it just has so many lenses, and it's, it's, it's huge, um, and I wouldn't want to film anything on it, personally. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of like, I feel like that's a new area that you could, there were new uh, technologies and, and um, artistic careers could emerge, but everything I've seen on like YouTube, et cetera, is just, it's this, you're still a talent manager. You're just helping people make money via a digital or virtual platform. Yeah. And I would just say in the same line that, um, every artist can't be expected to do all of the back end work, whether it's technical, whether it's financial, whether it's marketing, whether it's uh, fundraising, all of those things support artists to bring their art to the world. And, and I think, you know, it goes back to knowing where you want to be and what value you can bring to the, to the group. Right. And, and everyone can put an effort forth to, pro to provide an avenue for the art to be made and to be shared because the arts and humanities both are about about engaging in thought and engaging with your community and engaging with each other and and sharing our um uh you know our human experiences right they're about connecting and i i think that fundamentally i agree with phillips like fundamentally there's not going to be a lot of 
development in this terms of what you are actually doing, the work that's going to be done. It's going to be in titles and it's going to be in new technological advances in the field. So. Yeah, and I would just add, Sophia, that the, we're at a pivotal time right now. We're taking the, well, for example, the arts, we're taking the arts kicking and screaming faster than we wanted to go into the next stage, right? And we are using technology to do that. But there aren't a lot of people who are comfortable in both realms. So a possible new career could be like a translator, you know, somebody who can work and live in both worlds, but um, be able to communicate with each other and uh, connect. And I don't know what kind of career that would be, but I know that there's a lot of organizations that are struggling to determine the strategy that they want to take for this new direction before they were ready to do it. And everybody's trying to do it as fast as possible, which is not the best thing. <laughs> but um, for long term solutions to try and come up with those, I think that 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 would be a really cool thing to to study. And there are a lot of startups that are trying to figure out how to connect keep people connected without um, without draining them. Because I mean, this kind of Zoom technology, I'm, I'm teaching a class right now on Zoom and my kids are so fatigued. They, I mean, they asked for breaks in the middle of lectures and just like turn off cameras, turn off video so everybody can just stand up and stretch and not be on all the time. So I think that there's those kinds of things would be useful to think about. Yeah, I think I'll just add, actually, I had, I mean, I know several people now who, where the, the title may not be different, but where the focus around diversity and inclusion in the arts is really a change in the focus of what those positions mean to the organization and to the communities they serve. So I think, you know, positions that are evaluating what art is being created and who's being supported to create that art and then how that art is being presented and what art that organization is presenting. Um, I do think that that's being done in a new and meaningful way. Um, so I think that that would sort of be, you know, and that might be a place where the title itself might not change, but but the mission behind that really is that, that I think is, is worth thinking about. All right, we're coming up on the six o'clock hour. And so I think we're gonna end with Megan's question. However, Natalia and Sophia, you know, if you have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I can, you know, connect you all via email. So that way you can, you know, get those questions answered. So Megan asked for Phillips, how have you incorporated your theater experience from Hopkins into your career in arts and technology? Uh, mainly like, interpersonal skills so improvising um persuading directors to not change scenes uh a lot <laughs> a lot of these skills are like very transferable um even just just storytelling like i guess i'm unlucky i was an english major too um like i started my career in sales and i was having to explain technology to like university provosts and career centers um, and it took like some pretty some pretty good storytelling skills to make that sale and then uh, it's the same I, I, when I moved to Google like selling brand new technology that like has never existed before to clients uh, you have to be able to like craft a narrative um, and really make them care and um, envision what their company or service would look like if they integrated with this brand new Google feature. Uh, so yeah, I definitely think this the storytelling skills for me is like been the number one transferable skill. Um, and I feel like in the business world, they call it communication. And it's shocking how many business people and tech engineers, etc, are really bad at communicating. Um, and people like us who are familiar with having to constantly argue points and people who have in, like really good sense of empathy. Um, we actually like thrive in these environments because we're the people who are able to, uh, like our other panelists said, like turn the data or the technology into uh, turn into a story um, and be able to persuade the person on the other end to go with our recommendation. That's, that's how it's helped me in, in business for sure. 
Thank you so much, Lila, Phillips, Elizabeth, for being here, and Megan, Natalia, and Sophia for coming. And I hope that this was helpful in helping you to conceptualize how you might be able to, you know, marry your interests, whether your academic interests, your arts passions, you know, and Nicolene and I are always here to support you in that. So if you want to have more conversations, if we can connect you with more people, we're happy to do that. Um, this was wonderful. We so appreciate you taking the time to do this. So I hope everyone has a really great evening. Any last thoughts, words from the group? Thanks for putting this together, Hope and Nicolene. Really yes. fun conversation. Good. I'm so glad. Yeah, I agree. And I know, again, I'll wish the students a great semester and a great year. You know, they're doing the best. Like, Y'all are doing it. <laughs> yeah, best of luck. Awesome. Well, have a wonderful evening, everybody. I appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.